You're very fortunate. You have no allergies whatsoever. I found None out. None at all. But your brother Tom does. Tom has lots of them. When he was a kid, he had uh, warts on the sole of his feet. Soles of his feet. Mm -hmm. It's true. Couldn't walk around. It was like walking on constant gravel. Later on, he got uh, hay fever so badly that you couldn't sleep in the same apartment with him. Tom, for Pete's sake, will you stop sneezing? And he's like, I'll punch you right in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's no fun. Uh, you're fortunate, though, because you have no allergies and uh, no problems here in the Midwest at this time. This I know, and I'm grateful beyond belief. Where did you grow up? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to be when you grow up? Uh, we were born, I was born in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. As was Tom. We were raised on farms in Ohio around Mount Gilead. Williamsport, Marion, Galleon. You never heard of these towns. No, but you had hay fever around there, too. I think Illinois is one of the worst states. But the funny thing is, when people come into this area, they don't even know they have it. But if they happen to come at the wrong time of the yeah. year, they wonder, hey, well, did I catch a cold? What is this? Yeah. Well, I don't think it manifested itself in Tom until much later, until he was back east. Well, let's not talk about your brother, Tom, and the Who? fact that he's on... <laughs> <laughs> Mark and Mindy quite frequently these days. I've heard it? of him, yeah, them. <laughs> and he's doing all the U airlines, United Airlines commercials, and he's now playing in St. Louis, and I'll see him uh, night after tomorrow. Which I think is going to be the first time you've had a chance to visit with each other. In two years. In two yeah, years? Yeah. Whew. Show business is like that, and most people don't really realize yeah. it, but uh, you're working when a lot of times folks have days off, yeah. holidays we and things. We talk a lot on the phone, stuff like that, and keep in touch with our sister and mother and contact that way but uh, i haven't seen him for since he was in new york two years ago is tom older than you lord no mm. <laughs> nobody's older than i am <laughs> and he insists that i refer to him as my baby brother let me tell the folks who we're talking with this is dick poston who is um well known on the broadway stage um uh, you've done many broadway productions ten you also were in uh, some motion pictures like the lady sings the blues mm -hmm. and the candidate it's a date. I it's think. a date. <laughs> that was a movie, wasn't it? Yes, but when? <laughs> who was I in it? I don't have any idea who was in it other than you. Okay, and ask your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first picture with Deanna Durbin. Deanna Durbin? Yes. That goes back a good many years then. 1939. Whew. I was a bare child. It says here in small print. <laughs> You have, uh, what, seven screenplays that, that you've I've written? written? Yeah, and sold. That have been made into movies? I've, so, I've written more than that, but I've sold seven. Two of them were made. A couple of action pictures, terror film. What was it called? One was called The Jesus Trip, which was a motorcycle-type picture about a, a novice from a convent who was taken hostage by a motorcycle group. Turned out pretty good, got fantastic reviews, badly distributed. They still owe me $3,000 on it. <laughs> mm. A lot you know, of that going around, I guess. Well, you know, when, they, when it's a low budget, they defer. They say, okay, we'll pay you uh, $6,000 now and $3,000 when we sell it and make the profit back or, you know, make the cost back. Mm -hmm. And the other one was with uh, John Carradine and... Roderick Crawford called Blood of the Ghostly Horror. I didn't title it, <laughs> but it was a good picture. Usually you work on those films and the titles change, don't they, as Boy, time goes I'll along? Say, yeah. The original picture I titled The Grabbers, and the producer said, well, we'll get rid of that right away. You shrug, take the money, run. I know what you'd say, probably, if I would ask you, what would you rather be working on, a play or a movie? And you'd probably say a play. Absolutely. Oh, to be Neil Simon. <laughs> <laughs> because you have a lot more control then, don't you? Uh, basically, yes. Not only that, but uh, you get to see it happen. With movies, you, they take, you, take your script, and the next thing you know, they're putting in blue pages for rewrites and pink pages for rewrites. I went to see, watch the first day of shooting on the Jesus trip, and I couldn't believe it was the same script, you know. And I said, who did this? You know, and I say, this girl over here, was a Sosha producer, and she had lines that I couldn't believe, you know, but that's, that's when you lose the control. With stage, you get to watch the rehearsals, you get to 
see what the actors do. The director comes up and suggests changes and sends you off to a hotel room to make them, stuff like that. And occasionally you have to call yourself back in or you get called in to uh, find out what happened because the play's maybe doing very well and all of a sudden it just fizzles out, doesn't it? That's up to the director and stage manager. The author doesn't have much to do with it. Once it's set, you know, and they say, okay, we're opening with this... Unless, it, unless it's something like if you change stars, in the, uh, as in uh, the picture, the play on Broadway now, Sugar Babies. You've got Ann Miller, a great dancer, and Mickey Rooney, a great comic. So they take out the road show, and suddenly you've got Carol Channing, who's more of a singer and a comedian than a dancer, and Bobby Morris instead of Mickey Rooney, and so you change the show considerably. But with regular plays, you know, or comedy, like a Neil Simon show, you don't change it after it's set, what they call frozen. When it runs so long, too, like a show like Annie, hmm. and they have to get recasted and recasted yeah. and recasted, I imagine there's a lot of work that has to go back in, even, yeah. even with the actors, because maybe they try to put more into a line than really should be there sometimes. Well, not the writing. That doesn't change so much. Once in a while, you know, an actor will say, look, I know that he said this such and such a way, and it was for him at the time it was originated. Can I sort of make it fit me a little bit better by saying thus and so? And, and the director will say, yeah, I'll go ahead. Or they'll call the author and say, is it okay if he changes? And the author says, sure, just send me my check. <laughs> Let me ask you a question about uh, what you're doing tonight at ISU. I thought we'd so. never get around to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Lincoln versus Douglas, 1858. When you go back and you look at some of the some of the transcripts from some of these debates, they are just super dull, aren't they? <laughs> uh, Where'd you get that? <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you make them exciting? And how do you how do you say, hey, I want to do this? Because it's challenging. Well, it's fantastic that uh, uh, the men themselves were such showmen. You know, Stephen A. Douglas and Abraham Lincoln were fantastic crowd pleasers. Wherever they went, uh, the people came from as much as 150 miles away because they were better than a circus. They were funny, they were alive and vital, and they were pertinent to the times. Uh, as far as dullness is concerned, it is to us now because we weren't that involved with the uh, uh, events of those days. But I have been able to, with not only the seven debates themselves, but with everything that the two guys ever said or wrote, that was funny or entertaining or uh, painted a graphic picture of themselves that we today would be interested in and, and very theatrical, plus whatever they said that could be related to today. So that w there's a great pertinence today to what they said in those days in tonight's show. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to say, hey, you picked a real bummer to put together because I'm sure it's good. But I'm saying even like uh, a Hal Holbrook, a lot of people can read Mark Twain. Yeah. and not read the humor into it that Hal Holbrook puts yeah. into it when he does the show. So true. And um, that's why this is a real plus for folks who want to go see you tonight because you're going to be probably catching things that we wouldn't catch if we went back and looked at those, those Very, transcripts. Uh, I hope so. The thing about tonight's show, and of course I think the thing that makes it so <laughs> fantastically theatrical and has been so successful for the past four years, is that I can do both characters. And physically, they weren't alike, were they? Far from it. Five foot four, six foot four. <laughs> I shrink for the first act, and I grow tall for the second act. Here's what I want to know. How do you get them both on stage at the same time? With great difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I assume you I come out as one character yeah, first. I can't even get the two of them into the same car. <laughs> you know, the three of us went to visit Gettysburg a couple of years ago, and you wouldn't believe it. A couple of children, they were... Steve and Abe, and, and, and Steve refused to get out of the car. But <laughs> Abe and I wandered all over and saw the monuments and the places where the battles took place. And he got us lost, too. I said, where did you make that speech, you know, that address, the mm -hmm. Gettysburg? And he pointed in one direction, and I turned and looked, and I looked back, and he's pointing in another direction. He didn't know where it was. <laughs> he was lost. Maybe his hat lost. slipped down over his eyes or something. I'm not it was a great morning. The, it, was, it was like bright and early in November, and it was absolutely deserted. The whole Gettysburg battlefields, all the cemeteries, everything was, and it was just the three of us. And it had rained, like, unbelievably the night before, and there was a haze and a fog over everything, a sopping wet the most 
unbelievable experience you can imagine, you know, emotionally, to be at Gettysburg with those two guys. You know, people are kind of wondering with those two guys, you really start thinking like these characters, don't you? Talk to them all the time. And they fight. <gasps> and they <laughs> insist that I'm slanting toward one or the other, and I'm not. You know, I, they've got to be even or it's no contest, you know. Mm -hmm. And you can't even relate to the fact that poor Abe was shot before his time and and Steve died before his time, too, mm -hmm. of a broken heart. And, uh, but anyway, back to your how do you do it, get them both on stage at once. The, the first act is Stephen A. Douglas. And while he is orating and debating and making his pitch for the... Uh, Senate, United States Senate of Illinois, up in the shadows, upstage, is a life-size life cardboard cutout of me as Abe, listening, making notes on an envelope on his knee, naturally, and he waits and lets Douglas go crazy, and then there's an intermission, and when the second act starts, Abe comes out and up in the shadows, upstage is Steve, waiting, listening, paying attention, but not moving. <laughs> You've gotten terrific reviews. I've just heard some super, super superlatives. Said some about of them, show. I think, might have been written by my mother. <laughs> <laughs> We're interviewing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Lincoln. And <laughs> <laughs> you have fun on this station, don't you? We do. It's, that's what it's about. I used it? to be a disc jockey. I know you did. In Baltimore, and uh, when I, before you were born. <laughs> And it takes takes some getting used to, doesn't it? It it it, it does. <laughs> you don't. Uh, I see you have dials in front of you. I'm also a commercial pilot, and I think you're about ready to take off with all those <laughs> gadgets in front of you. I wonder, Dick, if anybody has a question they'd like to pop at you. Who is anybody? Maybe somebody out in the audience. We can have them call in. <laughs> Eight two nine two three four five. You know, this is real Lincoln country around here. Lincoln had a law office. Of course, he had law offices all over. I guess. I but, wouldn't uh, have right never downtown. have known that. And uh, <laughs> well, sure. You, I know you've traveled around, and we were on vacation this summer down in uh, Tennessee. Who's we? Got we? To look at my wife and I. Oh. Uh -huh. And um, when you start looking at some of these battlefields and things where the yeah. Civil War took place, uh, Shiloh, for instance, yeah, and some yeah. places like that, you really start to wonder what went through the minds of these men who were there and uh, who were in charge of them. Oh, boy. So, so if you have a question, 829-2345 is our number, or 1-800-322-9377. I'm not sure we'll get a Lincoln question or a Douglas question, maybe a question about you, but feel free to give us a call. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, no, you, uh, I was being facetious about knowing that this is Lincoln country. I've done more research here than... A lot of Lincoln buffs, and I love it. I go crazy when I see things like New Salem, you know, which they have restored. Mm -hmm. the CCC did that, and uh, and going through the uh, restored State House, the old State House in Springfield, and Lincoln's home. And do you know what they're now selling in the Lincoln Herndon law offices? I have no idea. Frozen yogurt. <laughs> it's the a, American way, I guess. It's a frozen yogurt parlor <laughs> <laughs> where Lincoln and Herndon used to have their law office in Springfield. There's a sign all over the place saying this is where and so forth and s frozen yogurt, 60 cents. Takes away a little bit of the historical <laughs> benefits, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah. You ought to go to the um, uh, David Davis Mansion while you're in town. Here? Yes, in Bloomington. Where is it? In um, Bloomington? In Bloomington. Who is David Davis? David Davis was uh, President Lincoln's campaign manager. That David Davis. That David Davis, Judge David Davis. Yeah, The yeah. big 300-pound um, sure. fella. With a bathtub like a swimming pool. He, you'll see it. I've heard about you it. You go there. I'll give you the tour and only charge you $10. I'll take it. It's 25 minutes after 10. Is yours one of the many families who have an old refrigerator in the basement or garage? One that still works and comes in handy to store the things you can't always fit in the kitchen refrigerator. Lots of families do keep their old refrigerator as a backup cooler when they buy a new one. While that antique refrigerator may come in handy, Illinois Power would like to point out that it may be very expensive to operate. Refrigerators built 10 or more years ago were made when energy seemed plentiful. Even when new, they consumed lots more electricity than a comparable new model does today. 
and the efficiency of that vintage refrigerator hasn't improved with age. Today's refrigerators, like most new appliances, are built for efficient use of energy, and you'll find their energy efficiency rating on a tag in the dealer's showroom. For information on how much you save with energy efficient appliances, ask the Energy Use Advisor at Illinois Power, where it's our business to serve you better. Save on do-it-yourself items during Parker Home Center's fall sale. Like a 10-pocket leather carpenter's apron for only $18.88. A Rockwell 8-inch bench table saw reduced to $139.97. Black and Decker variable speed jigsaws are just $26.88. And a handy shop vac 6-gallon wet-dry vac a low $44.88. These make great gift items for the home handyman, too. Enjoy free popcorn and lemonade and use your Visa and Master Charge. Shop weeknights till 9, Saturdays till 4. But hurry, sale ends this Saturday at Parker Home Center, East Oakland and Veterans Parkway, Bloomington. Go ahead. You're on the air with Dick Poston. Hello. Uh, uh, if you're going to see Dave, David Manchin, I'd like to have you come out to Normal City Hall and see where they unveiled Jesse Phil's uh, statue out there. It'd be interesting for you to see. That just sounds very interesting. I've heard an awful lot about Mr. Fell. Yes, yeah, so it'd be nice. I was, we live close down there, and, um, and it'd be nice if you, uh, if you could have seen the ceremony. But it's a nice statue down there, and it means a lot, and they got pamphlets down there for you to at the information desk for you to take and read. There's a lot Sounds of interesting things in their history since you're all in for history. Sounds great. I'm hip. Thanks for calling. Yeah, bye-bye. WJBC, good morning. Oops, an open line there. If you get a ringing line, please hang on to it. Goodness, it's 28 after 10 o'clock already? Mm. We have a newscast coming. Maybe I can hold you about five minutes or so because I know sure. you have to uh, get back to ISU. You're going to be talking to a class or something. My middle name is available this morning. <laughs> Dick Poston is our uh, guest talking about Lincoln versus Douglas, 1858. It's a show that starts at 8 o'clock tonight, and uh, I know there are some tickets left if you'd like to go. I think they're $7.550, and so it's very reasonable. You know, you start talking ticket prices when you go to Chicago or New York, and people are getting something like $20 a seat. $22 in some of these. for some of the shows, and you can't even get tickets for them. Things mm -hmm. like uh, a night in Hollywood, a day in the Ukraine, $23.50, and they're not selling tickets until, I mean, uh, they've sold tickets all up until Thanksgiving. Uh, we really have an excellent opportunity to see some fine things, and uh, this show is one of them. I saw the schedule for the season, and it looked pretty expensive exceptional. Have you had a chance to look at the auditorium? Yes, I have. Have you been in there? And yes. I uh, First thing I said was, because it has that continental seating, how do they get into their seats? Have you seen it? I mean, do you know what I'm talking about? You really can't uh, go from one aisle to the next. There's no aisle. The, uh, There's not a single aisle. Douglas comes down through the auditorium, not in that theater, because <laughs> each, each aisle has its own doorway from outside into the, into the theater itself. I wanted to ask you, maybe you can think about this while we're listening to the news. When you get into certain situations where auditoriums vary so much, um, has anything unusual happened some nights? <clears throat> maybe you couldn't get in. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll let you think about that. We'll break for the news, and then we can visit for about five or ten more minutes. Dick Poston is our guest. We won't mention Tom Poston either. Who? <laughs> Shop Pine's 40th anniversary sale and save 20% on coats, dresses, and sweaters. You're someone special at Pine's, College Hills Mall Normal, and Eastland Mall, Bloomington. It is 59 degrees at 1030. WJBC News, I'm Stacy Marshall reporting. A 23-year-old Bloomington man was pulled from his burning apartment this morning by firemen who found him lying unconscious on the kitchen floor. Firemen had to travel only two blocks from their Bloomington headquarters station to the two-story structure at 501 West Market. Firemen found one of the four apartments locked up and suspected that someone was still inside. They put on smoke masks, entered the burning apartment, and found Rick Williams on the floor. Fire Captain Don Coffey tells WJBC News. We find him right about the middle of the house. Um, he was, uh, wasn't burnt. It was just uh, mostly smoke inhalation. Williams is in serious condition at Mennonite Hospital, the apartment house owned by Robert Chasson of Silver Springs, Maryland, suffered about $18,000. Fire Captain Coffey says... Well, the bedroom, bathroom, and one hallway was completely burnt out, and the uh, rest of the apartment suffered smoke and water. The fire was reported at 2.40 this morning. More news after this. Every day is discount day. Shape up America and exercise your right to 
nation, do your bit for your nation. Register now, America, and vote. Shape up America and exercise your right to vote. WJBC reminds you that the deadline for voter registration in McLean County is Tuesday, October 7th. The Bloomington Board of Election Commissioners will maintain Saturday hours through October 4th from 9 a.m. till noon to register Bloomington residents only. WJBC, sharing and caring in McLean County. Bloomington Mayor Richard Buchanan has delayed a decision on whether he'll seek re-election next spring. Buchanan had hoped to make public his re-election plans by now, but he says there are some personal considerations that have forced him to delay that decision. Only one person has announced his candidacy for the mayor's job. He's Timothy Shank, Jr. A rural Tawanda man faces a variety of drug, weapons, and traffic charges this morning after his arrest following a minor traffic accident in Tazewell County yesterday. State police say 25-year-old Peter Glazer was charged with improper lane usage, driving on a revoked license, and driving under the influence of drugs following the accident at the intersection of routes 121 and 9. Authorities say a later search of Glazer's car uncovered an allegedly stolen handgun, hypodermic syringe, and an undisclosed quantity of substance believed to be narcotics. Glazer is lodged in the Tazewell County Jail awaiting a court date. The United Way campaign in McLean County is running ahead of schedule of last year. After today's weekly meeting, United Way officials say they've presently uh, pledged 48.7 percent of their campaign goal of about $624,000. That compares to about 43 percent at the same stage last year. Gasoline prices continue to fall throughout Illinois as well as in the Chicago area. The Chicago Motor Club says during the last two months, average prices for all types of gasoline have dropped nearly two cents a gallon. Throughout Illinois, full-service regular gasoline was 127 a gallon for unleaded regular and 131, and premium was going for 137 a gallon. Hoopston's battle against Starlings has been put to rest as, after successfully ridding the East Central Illinois town of the messy birds. For the last two weeks, citizens shot at the birds with shotguns, banged pots and pans together, and the fire department has even hosed down some of their roosting places with high-pressure hoses. City officials are saying all that activity, along with the playing of cries of a wounded starling over local radio stations, scared the birds off. Since last Friday, WHPO has broadcast the tape in the early evening hours so residents could point their radio speakers outside and scare the birds off. In the last few days, the huge flock that numbered in the tens of thousands had been reduced to a few small groups. Most of the birds have apparently flown back into the countryside or into neighboring communities. City officials say they'll use their newfound starling strategies again next spring if the birds show up again. Despite muted complaints that too many Illinois congressmen have been running for the GOP leadership post, Congressman Edward Madigan of Lincoln has his eye on the fifth-ranked position in the party's House leadership. The 44-year-old Madigan said yesterday he would decide by December 1st whether to run for chairman of the party's research committee. Should be partly sunny and cool today with a chance of brief showers late this afternoon and a high near 67. Cloudy and quite cool overnight with a chance of brief showers and overnight low near 40. And decreasing cloudiness and cool tomorrow with a high near 55 with a chance of frost tomorrow night. Currently winds are out of the southwest at 1 to 2 miles an hour. The barometer stands at 29.81 inches and rising. The relative humidity 80 percent and the WJBC temperature 60 degrees. Stacy Marshall, WJBC News. Thank you, Stacy. Casey, this is a fun morning for me to have you in the studio, Tom. Dick. Uh, uh, Dick. <laughs> Wasn't going to mention Tom. It's okay, Charlie. <clears throat> Tom Poston is uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, and uh, Mine too. He worked with Louis Nye and, uh, let's see, Don Knotts and Steve Allen. I was talking to Louis Nye. He was a disc jockey. Yeah. And I had him on the air one time. He said for one of the radio station promotions that he did, and I'm sure you did some of these crazy things too, uh, they had parakeets in the studio because they were giving them away for, through some promotion. But yeah. for an entire week, the thing was loaded with bird cages, and every time they'd pop a mic open to talk, you could hear mm -hmm. parakeets <laughs> singing in the background, which had to get some sure. some attention. Did you have time to think about that? Any strange things really happen while you're doing the Lincoln Douglas? I mean, it's it's meant to be a, an historic piece with with humor in it, but uh, yeah. Well, uh, gee, I didn't think of it that way. I thought. Uh I thought we were talking about theaters. I was going to say, uh, I've done the show and everything from uh, cafeteria to uh, a few weeks ago I was in Greenville, South Carolina and walked out on stage and there are 7,000 packed seats. 
stretching into infinity, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one time in Albion, Michigan, uh, anyway, 7,000 seats can be pretty intimidating. <laughs> you figure <laughs> you've got to reach all those ears and still be entertaining, even though from the back of the house you're a dot. But uh, in Albion, Michigan, one night the lights went out. And, of course, you're not expecting it, and you, you have no preparation or anticipation for it. And I was playing Douglas at the time, and Douglas has a very rasping voice, George C. Scott-type voice, because he was the great orator, you know. And there was a br second where I didn't know what the heck to do next or whether to go on or what, and just suddenly it came to me as if Steve did it himself. He says, somebody close those doors back there. The wind is blowing out these lamps. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. And then the, they hit the fuse and brought the lights back up and got a great hand of applause. <laughs> I guess that really is one of the marks of a true actor, though, isn't it? Because you start thinking like the character, and you can respond in certain situations. It's better if you can stay in character, even in emergencies. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Um, I know you did this at Lincoln Center, this show, and you've been touring mm -hmm. in different campuses for the last four years. Four years, yeah. So people have a chance to see you tonight. Lincoln versus Douglas, 1858. Um... It's a fantastic show, basically, because it's different. It's a departure from any other one-man show you can imagine. The show has conflict, it has a plot, it has, reaches a climax. And uh, the variety of the two characters themselves, not only in their beliefs and their stature, but their entire manner and approach to debating. And since you're not going to get too many debates in this election this year... <laughs> Here's see, going to be see, one tonight. Here's where debates really began, and they had at each other like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it was a circus. It was a. It was fantastically theatrical, and entertaining. And they were different then too. They're not really like a press conference anymore. Uh, In the right. old days, the audience was also part of it. But I don't know how I could handle that. <laughs> if somebody started <laughs> hollering up from the audience the way they did in those days. Uh, Douglas starts off by saying, "Now you'll do me a big favor if you don't." say anything during and if they said anything I think I'd <laughs> fall <laughs> apart before I let you go I want to have a question here for somebody and uh, if they can answer it we'll give them a couple of tickets for tonight's show how about that very good do you have a question do you want me to ask the question why don't you come up with a good trivia question maybe that uh, about Lincoln about Lincoln um, back in the 30s they made a motion picture called young Abe Lincoln who played the part who played the part of young Abe Lincoln in the movie from the 30s? Yeah. 8292345 is our number. If you can answer it, we'll send you to tonight's show, the Lincoln versus Douglas debate, 1858. Actually, it's called Lincoln versus Douglas, 1858. Actually, it's called Dick Poston as Lincoln versus <laughs> Douglas, 1858. That's the way you know it's a one man show. <laughs> All right. Since you asked the question, I'll see if I have the right answer. Good morning. Hi. Is it Raymond Massey? Mm, no, it's not, is it? No. Good guess, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, WJBC. Was it Henry Fonda? Henry. Yes, it was. Henry Fonda. <laughs> Hope you can make it to the show tonight, ma'am. Oh, uh, we have tickets. We plan to be there. Well, you've won a couple of more. Hope you can take some friends. <laughs> I'll see if I can find somebody. Don't go away, because I want to get your address, okay? Oh, okay. It's 20 minutes in front of 11 o'clock. Actually, your name and address. There's no way we're going to be able to mail them anymore. No, they can pick them up at the box office, can't they? Well, we'll make arrangements because I have the tickets here. Great. Um, Incidentally, Raymond Massey was in the picture Abe Lincoln in Illinois, which was a Robert Sherwood play and then a movie and also a big hit. Dick, I hope you enjoy your stay while you're in Bloomington Normal. I love it. I always love Illinois. And Can't uh, wait to get back. I do thank you so much for dropping by today. I know this is early for an actor because usually, well, you start working at night. Yeah, basically, but I'm also a morning person. I don't sleep that much anyway. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, tonight's the night, Lincoln versus Douglas, 1858, at the Illinois State University Union Auditorium. Gets underway at 8 o'clock. You should get there before that, though, so you get a good seat. And uh, tickets are 7 and 5.50. It's one of those shows that uh, comes around all too rarely, really. Well, thank you, Ken. Nice visiting. Me too. <laughs>